The outdoor KZ crew is heading to the Jatissou Alatau. From Almaty, it takes about two hours to get to its southwest spurs by car. Yet to reach the high elevated mountain part of the ridge, you will need more than a week. There are no highways there and even horses cannot get everywhere. It is one of the most remote corners of Kazakhstan and this is exactly what attracts the fans of the untouched wilderness. The first settlements in the Jatissou Alatau foothills appeared earlier than Rome was founded. When Homer was writing his Iliad, here people were already breeding cattle and melting metal. On the one hand, there are so many archaeological sites here. On the other hand, there are places here where no human has ever set his foot. The ancient Greek philosopher Hecates of Miletus called the entire inhabited world the Cumini. According to Hecateus, Hellas was naturally the Cumini's center, and by its size it was hardly larger than our Jungaralatau National Park. In those days, the Peloponnesus Peninsula was covered with pristine forests inhabited by lions, wild buffalo, aurochs and bears. In the same time, the Jatissou Alatau was home to Argali, ibexes, bears and snow leopards. 3,000 years have passed and a lot has changed. Now you can find lions and bears in Greece only in illustrations to ancient literary works, next to mythical centaurs, while ibexes, bears and leopards are still happily living in the Jatissou. In fact, it's very important as every country is not so lucky. Those of us who have been to the region suffering from overpopulation and environmental degradation clearly see the value of vast and untouched wilderness areas. Previously, they called the Jatissou or Semirechia Alatau the Jungarian Alatau. The title originated in the Chinese geography as in the southeast, the ridge connects with the Jungarian plain. In Kazakhstan, they call it Jatissou because its northern slopes and southwestern spurs descend to the region of Jatissou. Preparing for our big journey across the Jatissou Alatau, we decided to collect as much historical information as possible about the area. It was hard to decide what to start with. The publications of the Geography Institute on Melting Glaciers, Zoological Inventories, the Journey Notes by Chokan Valikanov, or say the Chronicles of the Great Silk Way. All of these sources are interesting and quite informative. Eventually, we decided not to waste our time on trifles and start from the very beginning, the emergence of the Jungar Ridge. We are heading to the Altinamel National Park. The rock debris desert is extending between the Jatissou southwestern spurs and the Ili River. From the vehicle window you can see the fleet-footed goited gazelles and small herds of wild donkeys, also known as Asiatic wild asses or kulans. In the past, they roamed these plains by thousands but were exterminated 200 years ago. These beautiful animals came back to the Ili coast only in the 80s of the last century. On the left, there stretches a chain of dry low mountains, Chulak, Matai and Altinamel. In the course of the last 500 million years, the mountains in the southeast of modern Kazakhstan have emerged and completely disappeared several times, transforming into plains. During global warming periods, they were flooded by ocean. During ice ages, the ocean retreated. For paleontologists, the Jatissou Alatau is a true storeroom of finds, as there are so many interesting things that a trying researcher's look may find in these sedimentary rock formations. For example, the bone remains of giant reptiles that had appeared here about 250 million years ago and reigned the place for almost 200 million years. The remote descendants of dinosaurs have survived to the present day. If you imagine this cute Stepagama a thousand times larger in size, it will turn into a huge lizard. By the way, all birds are also the descendants of flying dinosaurs.
In those days, small animals similar to modern gerbils were muddling along the beast-like lizards. Scientists have found their tiny bones in these slopes too. They were the first mammals. At first they, like reptiles, laid eggs but gradually learned to carry their babies inside their bodies which became an important competitive advantage in the battle for survival. The then giant animals probably didn't pay attention to such a trifle and later learned how wrong they were. Dinosaur babies hatched from eggs small and quite helpless, while their huge but tight-minded parents were slowly eating up the branches of ferns, our small but cunning and fast associates in the mammals' class devoured their defenseless children. These are the Atau Mountains, the favorite place for geologists. Like ancient manuscripts, these multicolored rocks encrypt our entire geological history. Time was destroying the ancient mountains, water and wind were carrying their remains down to valleys, and the fine particles were settling down in the water, forming sedimentary rocks. Under pressure, with time, sand and pebbles cemented together, turning into sandstone, lime and marm rock. In whatever regions of the planet scientists were studying the geological layers, everywhere in the Kinozoic they would find fewer and fewer dinosaur remains and more mammalian bones. This phenomenon is known as the Cretaceous Paleogene Extinction. So far there is no consensus about what caused the dinosaur fauna to die, yet the hypothesis that our ancestors, mammals, are to blame is now the main one. There's also a theory saying that about 65 million years ago, an asteroid the size of a city district hit our planet and caused an explosion so strong that the smoke from it covered the sky for 1,000 years. For dinosaurs, it was a true disaster. For us, mammals, it has become the time of triumph. When our distant ancestors, having waited through the millennium-long winter in their holes, came out into the white light, they found a planet very much suitable for life. It was beautiful and free. Mammals quickly spread across it and formed tens of thousands of biological species, of which only 5,500 survived to our days. Once upon a time, the Jungara Latau was a plain with subtropical climate. Giraffes, rhinos, tapirs and ostriches were wandering among magnolias and oleanders. The bones of giant mammals are exhibited in different museums around the world. The area of the Altinamel National Park could make an excellent tropical resort with holiday makers resting under palm trees and watching dolphins frolicking in the warm sea. But about 40 million years ago, an event took place that had fundamentally changed the course of the geological history. In the Paleogene, India crashed into Eurasia at full speed. The two continental plates came into contact at a terrible rate by geological standards, 15 centimeters per year. The Indian plate bent under the Asian plate. At the point of collision, the Earth's crust ascended forming the Himalayas, Tian Shan and Jungaralatau. The process went on for millions of years. With the changing climate, the local fauna was changing as well. Instead of tropical animals, mammoths, deer, mountain goats and sheep, bears and snow leopards appeared. Herds of bisons, horses and saiga filled the steppe. During the last ice age, the gorges of the Jungaralata were filled with glaciers up to the rim. At present, we can see their traces. Sliding down into valleys, they formed giant moraines. The Jungarala Tau acquired its more or less modern shape about 11,000 years ago. Natural history includes five great extinctions, but environmentalists believe that we are currently going through the sixth extinction period. This time, it wasn't caused by a meteorite, but by humans. They are finding petroglyphs and primitive people settlements throughout the whole area of Jetisu, from foothills up to mountain passes. During the last ice age, humans lived in the plains and hunted large mammals. 
By the 10th millennium BC, though, the bone remains of mammoths, giant deer, wool rhinos, and other megafauna representatives disappear completely. That was the time of yet another extinction period. The cultural layers of these settlements contain bones of wild horses, stab bison, ibexes, argali, and saiga. Whereas scientists do not agree on what caused the death of mammoth fauna, horses, bisons and dorics, no doubt, were destroyed by primitive hunters. There is a place in the valley between the Daguerres Ridge and the Kapchagai Reservoir which has been considered sacred for centuries. They call it Bess Chateau. There are about 2,000 large and small mounds on the premises of the Altinemel National Park. The most impressive ones are located in the park's northern part. Most of the northern group mounds date 4th 6th centuries BC. That was the time when the Saka tribal unions achieved their greatest power. Some of the evidence about the military attacks by the Saka on the countries of Asia Minor have survived to our time. How did it happen that cavalry had emerged in the Kazakh steppes capable of crushing the strongest armies of that time? Not all the theories by the famous ethnographer Lev Guminov have found support among the modern scientific community. But his thoughts that he had expressed in his book Ethnogeny and the Earth's Biosphere are currently beyond any shadow of doubt. Ethnoses form in certain landscapes, thus social changes are integrally linked with natural factors. In order for the horse to be domesticated by humans, at least two environmental conditions had to come together at one point of time. Firstly, wild horses were supposed to be abundant in the Kazakh steppes, and secondly, people had to live side by side with horses for many centuries or even millennia, hunting them, observing them, and feeding foals that had accidentally lost their parents. For nomadic horses to turn into a formidable military machine, it was necessary that for many years there had been excellent grass cover in the steppes and foothills, good humidity levels and no natural cataclysms. Those long years of abundance had allowed human communities and animal populations to gain the excessive power and energy that later spilled over across the land in the form of military campaigns. The Saka used the largest mounds to bury their military chiefs. The burial vault itself is made of the trunks of the Tianshan spruce, yet some of its elements are made of juniper, which allows scientists to draw global level conclusions. The fact is that currently archer or juniper grows much further to the south, in the mountains of Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. If 2,500 years ago it grew on the slopes of the Jungar Alatau, then the average annual temperature back then was a few degrees higher. This allegation by archaeologists is confirmed by the climatological data. If the average annual temperatures were higher, then the climate here was more humid and the grass in the pre-mountain steppes was even lusher. That created the favorable conditions for the development of nomadic civilizations, especially the cavalry. This is how history links with ecology and ecology gets reflected in art. Golden decorations made in the so-called animal style have been found in the burials of the Saka nobility. The images of ibexes, morals, snow leopards, wolves and other animals show that these animals played an important role in the Saka cultural tradition. Scientists can use these pieces of art to identify the animals that had lived in the steppe during this or that era. The Saka had no writing, so researchers obtained the information about them from art items, material culture and written sources of other peoples. Herodotus was the first one to describe the animal world of the Saka land, although his descriptions were more like a script of the Game of Thrones type fantasy. The father of history referred to people with heads of different animals as well as flying leopards guarding golden mountains. 
In the 2nd century BC, the northern branch of the Great Silk Way passed along the foothills of the Junga Ridge. Along that path, merchants and dervishes were carrying more reliable data about the land. Roman historians Strabo and Pliny the Elder also have their own description of the land of the Saka, which can even be called scientific to a certain extent. For example, Strabo describes how the eastern Scythians hunt an animal which they called Coloss. A mix of deer and lamb and running faster than leopard. Is it possible that he meant the Saiga? In his book Natural History, Gaius Pliny the Elder mentions Capricorns and mountain goats with huge horns. Also, according to him, the Saka arrange overtaking hunts for wild horses, donkeys and oryx. Modern paleontology confirms this information. The steppe bisons seem to have been exterminated by humans before Pliny, and wild horses and bulls have almost survived to the present day. The last wild horse, Tarpan, was killed in 1824, and the last Eurasian oryx was killed even earlier, in 1602. We are leaving the Altinamel National Park and moving to the northern macro slope of the Jatisu Ridge. We are now on the left bank of the Bian River. This rock massif is called Bayan Jurek. We have found a lot of petroglyphs here depicting ibexes, morals, and different hunting scenes. to the upper reaches of the Kora River. The way is not easy, but it might be that specifically thanks to difficult access, the Jatisu Alatau managed to preserve its pristine purity. An accident. One of our SUVs turned over. We are lucky it didn't fall off the cliff. In the mountains, anything can happen. So we put it back on wheels, fixed the windows with scotch tape and went on. famous among tourists due to the highest waterfall in Central Asia. The Bukhan Bulag consists of four cascades with a total vertical difference of 168 meters. The ancients believed bathing in the waterfall had a rejuvenating effect. We'll see about that, but it definitely brings you back to your senses. The upper streams of the Kura River are home to ibexes, morals, bears, boars and a small population of mountain goats. Just driving through the gorge you will most likely not see them. Many tourists who are used to the abundance of animals in the national parks of Africa and North America ask a reasonable question, why did we not see anything? An experienced guide will of course be able to show some wild animals to tourists, but for this purpose they will have to do some walking and hiking in the mountains, sleep in tents and get a good taste of the harsh wilderness romance. Not all of us are capable of such sacrifices, not to mention that even with good binoculars it's not that easy to catch that animal barely visible amidst rocks or woods. As a rule, morale calves appear in late May, early June, but there can be exceptions. This one, for example, was born only a month and a half ago. It has to hurry up and get strong before the cold comes. Since it's difficult to approach animals close enough for a high-quality image, photo traps come really handy. No, this this trap took pictures of six young morales. Now morales are beginning to form their harems. Depending on the rank and the social status of a given male, there can be up to 15 males in his harem. 
достигать 15 особей. Many tourists ask why in some national parks in Africa and America animals let photographers come really close to them. In fact, wild animals allowing you to photograph them from a 10-meter distance is more of a tourist attraction than real wildlife. What they do in parks is they feed wild animals close to observation sites and create the most quiet and comfortable conditions for them all year round. After decades and decades of such quiet life, animals get used to tourists and stop reacting to them. In a natural environment where animals are constantly struggling for their existence, they usually behave themselves more carefully. Yet there is another factor which ecologists call the empty forest syndrome. Sometimes in deserted and outwardly quiet prosperous landscapes with high grass and thick woods, there are very few wild animals. Perhaps the natural balance in such places was broken much earlier. The forest managed to cover the traces of previous human activity, but the inflicted changes were so significant that it will take many years for the nature to recover, maybe even several centuries. It's like a person who appears healthy on the outside. He can be tall and broad-shouldered, but if you take his blood test, you might see that his cholesterol or sugar level is abnormal. His metabolism is unbalanced. It's really hard and even impossible to restore these processes. People are just beginning to understand that nature is a single and complicated organism. If liver doesn't work well, then the visually healthy hands and legs will start malfunctioning as well. The expedition moves 150 kilometers to the east and enters the premises of the Jongarala Town National Park. The road is going up to the Tentec River. Here in a matter of a couple of hours we can visually track the altitudinal zonality of the ridge. The foothill steps are below and then come the fruit and deciduous woods. This is exactly where the famous Almaty apple or Malus Siversi tree grows. At about 1,500 meters, mountain softwood forests begin. Above them, there come the alpine meadows. We are on the bank of the first Tentec River. There is a huge barrow in the Uigentas natural boundary. Today we have found several dozens of ancient burials of approximately identical sizes and design. Scientists believe them to belong to the early Turks era. We want to cross the eastern spurs of the Jungarala town. The road snakes over steep slopes for another 20 kilometers and then comes to an end. Further, we will go on horseback. The climate sharply changes at the altitude of 1,500 meters above sea level. We are on the Atopkan Pass. From here you can get a really nice view of the Tentec Tu River Valley. Our next destination point, Tastau Tourist Camp, is 28 kilometers away. On the plain, you can cover 28 kilometers on horseback in just one day. In difficult mountain landscapes, such a trip may take a whole week. The eastern part of the Jatisu Alatau is known among tourists far beyond Kazakhstan. Yet, they are no ordinary tourists. They are called photo hunters, willing to endure the Spartan way of life, carry heavy backpacks and live in tents for weeks, only to have a chance to take pictures of wild animals in their natural habitats. No economic activity is allowed here. The local Argali Marals, Ibexes and Vares are walking the same paths that their distant ancestors had laid many years ago. 
in the upper Paleogene. The nature here is pristine with only a couple of eco-tourist routes. Taking the complicated mountain landscape and rocky relief, you can travel here on horseback only accompanied by experienced guides. Local horses of the Jabeh breed are used to steep gorges, but they are still no climbers and cannot pass everywhere. So don't go up to a rocky section without knowing the trail. It's also necessary to know river shallows to be able to cross them. If the current takes your horse off its feet, a not so pleasant swim in a violent stream is guaranteed. In a horseback hike, the cargo's weight and volume are extremely important. The luggage is transported in saddle bags, also known as the corgens. One corgen per rider. In addition to personal clothes and belongings, your sleeping bag, tent, rain cover and a supply of food should fit in there. By all means, clothes should include a down jacket and warm underwear. At first it may seem impossible to fit all of it into two small bags, but it comes with experience. At night, the temperature in the alpine belt may drop down to zero degrees. If you want to see wild animals, you need to wake up at 5 a.m. and rush to the nearest summit. Even if you are not a photo hunter, but just want to take a picture of a beautiful landscape, you still have to get up early. Photographers call dawn the regime time, that is, the time of the best lighting. During the day, the shades are too sharp. An attentive photographer will find something to do even at night. A garden spider will make a great model too. And this handsome here is the wasp spider. It's not every day that you have gorgeous sunsets in the mountains. Every once in a while, you have to put up your tents in pouring rain. We hoped that we could find shelter in the old hut, but soon realized it was a bad idea. We are in Tulegensai, and it's raining right now. This is our VIP hotel. The common folk will have to bear with the tents. We'll have to give it a second try, as the previous portion turned over. It takes about five minutes. We have neighbors. Wasps are also hiding from the rain here. If, after a tedious journey, your expedition colleagues manage to wake you up next morning, you have a chance to see something interesting. Take your binoculars, go to the nearest summit and carefully examine the neighborhood. By the way, there is no need to go anywhere to take a picture of a squirrel. The curious model will come to you itself. If you are lucky, you will see morales, ibexes and even a bear. Tourists like to take pictures of bears. It might be that even the conditional risk adds some good drive to it. Although it is not recommended to get close to bears, our tireless photo enthusiasts decided to take the risk. After all, without risking it, it is impossible to post a me and a bear photo in the social media, right? At first it seems working out, a long-eared bear is passionately looking for something in the grass on the opposite slope of the gorge. Berries, or maybe ants. Bear's vision is not that good, but smell and hearing are simply great. The oncoming wind is blowing. The bear doesn't smell the operators and is slowly moving towards them. It's absolutely calm and there are no signs of aggression, yet the distance is shrinking. What to do in such a situation? The best thing to do is to stand upright and yell loudly in order to show it to the bear from afar that you are a human and that it should not approach you. In the vast majority of cases, the innate fear of humans will cause the animal to run away.
but our photo hunters have lost their nerve. Running away from a bear, you don't have to run faster than the bear. It's enough to run faster than your friend. An unexpected and short distance meeting with a boar is another rather questionable entertainment. Yet, if the boar notices you from afar, it will definitely run away. Unlike boars, wolves are predators. But in the last decades, in the mountains, there were no registered cases of wolves attacking humans, especially in summer. Their favorite prey is roe deer. Wolves hunt them collectively, distributing roles. Some hide in an ambush, while others chase the prey. In recent years, the roe deer population in the mountains has decreased considerably, and scientists are looking for a cause. We are leaving the coniferous forest below and descending to the alpine meadow belt. The Sandiktas peak is right in front of us, glimmering with its snow-covered caps. Ibexes escape from summer heat on rocky mountain slopes. Adult males come really close to glaciers, while females and cubs remain slightly lower. When the autumn snow will cover the peaks, they will descend into the valleys and form mixed herds. Males and females will spend the winter together, and in the spring the males will continue their bachelor hikes. Based on the reports of zoologists of the last century, the ibex population in the Jungara Latau was the highest in Eurasia. It has somewhat declined in recent years, but there are still plenty of ibexes around. We are descending to the Tastau River Valley. Here in the tourist camp, the horseback segment of our trip ends. We will relax for a day in the more comfortable conditions, take a hot bath and will continue our journey on SUVs. We are going up to the Minteke Gorge. Minteke translates as a thousand teke, that is, a thousand mountain goats. The road follows a steep serpentine and is blocked in some places. One hundred kilometers to the village of Tokti, but it's a hell of a road. On the way, we stop by a reindeer farm where they breed the Far Eastern dappled deer. The idea of raising dappled deer in the area where morals live seems strange to many specialists. The country road leads us to the small village of Tokti, only a few kilometers left to the highway. Finally, the expedition reaches the Ucharal Druzhba Highway. We are already in the middle of the Jungar Gate and turning right a little further, our expedition would soon come to the Kazakh Chinese border. For more than 2,000 years, merchants were transporting their goods through the Jungar Gate, from China to the west and back. For centuries, bloody wars were waged to control the northern branch of the Great Silk Way. Armies of conquerors came and went, eras replaced each other, but this caravan path is still operating. Yet, we are turning left, towards Almaty, because our expedition has come to an end and it is time for us to go back home.